Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mac Lumpkin. I'm from the Bill and Mel Melinda Gates Foundation, and I have the honor of being the chair of this session this afternoon, where we're going to talk a little bit about what is known as the WHO PQ NRA Collaborative Review <laughs> Process. We are really fortunate this afternoon to have people with us who, first of all, are experts in this whole process because in the case of Milan, they developed it and have actually um, been the one who has really advocated for this program and has taken it through its early pilot phases. Um, we have people from an NRA, we have people from an SRA, and I think you're hopefully going to have an opportunity this afternoon to really hear all the different aspects of this particular initiative that has been underway for a couple of years now to try to look at what can be done to try to rationalize the, um, the situation when it comes to registration activities. And just so we're all on the same page when we start to hear from the experts, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to talk with you a little bit and to share some ideas with you about the realities of trying to register products in the countries that we and most of you are focused on. I think for those of us that were raised in high income countries or those of us that live in high income countries, we generally tend to think of products being discovered and developed, a dossier being developed, it being filed with the local NRA, it being authorized, and then it being available for delivery um, and use by the patient population. Well, in the countries that we are focused on, obviously it's a little bit more complicated, and there are several different steps that products must go through in their regulatory journey to ultimately getting to the delivery of product to patients. One of the differences that we're not going to be talking about today is procurement, which we all know is one of the steps and one of the time-consuming steps to ultimately get products to the patients in the countries that we are focused on. But in the world of marketing authorization, I wanted to walk with you through the situation that we have of starting with the local NRA registration because in most countries nowadays, and I think many of you realize 20, 25, 30 years ago, it was not the case that many, that most countries had their own national regulatory authority, but at this point in time, generally, most countries do have a national regulatory authority and the product must be registered with the country's NRA in order for it to be used legally within that country. But because, as we all know, in, in many of the countries that we're focusing, focused on, the resources that are available to the local NRA are really rather constrained. And the ability of the NRA to perform all of the activities that uh, are needed in order to assess the products that are on their market and in order to maintain the supply security of those markets are often not there. And so in the past, the procurement agencies decided that they needed another process to try to help um, give them some quality assurance that indeed the money that they were spending to procure products were indeed going to be products that were high quality and that the money was being spent in a good way. So in order for procurement to occur, not only do you have to have local registration, but often you have to have, in the case of products that are pre-qualification eligible, you have to have WHO pre-qualification. And then since most of the products that we're talking about are not products that are manufactured in the country of use, they are manufactured in another country, and often that country will require a registration in that country prior to it going through this process. So instead of just going from here to the National Regulatory Authority to the people, which is more the model for high income countries, we have this reality that uh, we all are aware of in trying to get the products registered in the countries that uh, we are focusing on. 
Just to give you an idea, and this is some data from the East African community, just comparing the populations and then the size of the NRA staff, when you look at the United States and the United Kingdom, and then you look at the five countries that are in the East African community, and as a region, they end up with about 600 regulatory staff for 144 million people. And I think when we look at the backgrounds of many of these regulatory staff, as you were aware, the, probably the great majority are going to be pharmacists because for the most part, these countries have been looking at generic drugs, they're looking at um, CMC parts of the registration process, and when new products come in, where one has to then evaluate clinical efficacy and clinical safety, again, having the resources available sometimes have become challenges. So again, given the resource constraints here and the requirements of procurement, this particular system is what has been worked out. Now, when you look at that system, one of the things that we heard at the foundation was that in order to get something through that three-prong system, it could take between four and seven years. Well, you know, if you've got a good dossier, if you've got a product that you show you can manufacture in a consistent manner in compliance with GMPs, you can get your product through the FDA or the EMA in around 10 to 12 months on average. But now we're talking about getting that product to people in low and middle income countries and it taking at least what we were hearing was four to seven years. But what we had trouble was trying to figure out what are the data for this? Because we heard a lot of urban legends, we heard a lot of finger pointing, we heard a lot of N of one cases of this was my experience when I did it. But when we went and tried to find something in the literature or something in the regulatory world of saying, well, this is what happens in those three buckets of time, we really could not find it. So back in 2012, we undertook um, at the foundation an effort to try to figure out what was going on in these three areas. Why would it take four to seven years, if indeed that was true, to get these products to the point where they indeed had a local registration. And this is what we found out. And I mean, these are data that we would probably never be, be accepted at the New England Journal. Um, these are the best data we could come up with, talking to different people, talking to regulators, talking to companies, uh, looking at the last 200 products that had gone through WHO pre-qualification and trying to figure out kind of what was their story. And this is what we basically, oops, sorry. This is what we came up with here, was dividing it between medicines and vaccines and whether the first approval went through a stringent regulatory authority as defined by WHO, which basically in these cases meant either the US FDA or the EMA, or if it went through an, an NRA, which we're talking about manufacturer here, predominantly these were products that came either from India or China. Um, as the source of manufacture and the source of first authorization. And then looked at, and no surprises there, this is the kind of the 10 month, 15 month time frame that we expected. Then looked at the PQ time frame, once something had been here and it went to PQ, how long did it take to get through PQ? And then over on the end, just looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, once a product had been approved here, had been pre-qualified, how long did it take? to go through here. And you see the numbers that came up here, and the boxes are actually areas that we thought perhaps were areas that the foundation might be able to work with partners to see if perhaps there is a way to decrease some of these times. And I will say here on the PQ, these numbers are again are back at 2012. These numbers more recently have gone down considerably because of very, very, I think, critical efforts that WHO PreQ has made to address some of the issues that were highlighted here. What I want to talk about today, because I think it's the basis for the collaborative process you're going to hear about, which is really how do you get from here to the end of here as efficiently as possible. And this is, I think, one of the more interesting boxes. We ultimately called it the spread, and this is what we found out. 
it works. Can it advance? Thanks. Is that looking at this is a product. This was actually an HIV product. And you see SRAA and SRAB. One of these was FDA, one was EMA. You see the 10 month kind of time frame from submission to authorization. Then these are all separate Sub Saharan African NRAs that that product was then ultimately over time submitted to. And you can see from the first one to the very last one, there was a spread of almost one, two, three and a half years before this NRA ever even got the application. And then there were these wide swings in the amount of time each of the NRAs took. Well, when we talk to the companies about why was this happening, the kinds of response, and I think if those of you from the companies realize, the kind of responses we got back were, look, in reality, these are not high priority applications. Um, we get to them when we can get to them, when we can put resources on them, and on top of that, they all have different requirements. They all have different formats. There are five different languages represented here that we have to file in. And so since these are not high priority countries for, from a multinational corporation perspective, you see what happens in the spread here. And so can you advance, please? So coming back to here, you see the amount of time that often exists between pre-qualification approval and ultimately getting it here to the local NRA for them to do theirs. Can you advance, please? Um, so one of the ideas, and this is what we're going to be talking about here, of kind of how to address some of these issues is this thing called the WHOPQ NRA Collaborative Procedure. And Milan, who is the father of this, is going to be talking to you about it in depth in just a couple of minutes. But I wanted you just to see kind of how it fits into this overall process that we've been talking about. And that is, if you start with a product that comes from an SRA, as you will hear, when it goes to WHOPQ, it has what's called now an abbreviated PQ assessment because PQ relies on the scientific assessment that's done here and relies on the inspections that are done here in most cases. If it comes from a non-SRA as the initial authorizer or in the case of medicines and diagnostics, if it just comes here for the first assessment, it gets a full pre-qualification assessment. So pre-qualification does the inspection, pre-qualification does the scientific assessment, and either place where it comes from, one of the real values added by pre-qualification is it includes a country suitability assessment, looking at the product from the perspective of how it's going to be used here, does it meet the stability needs? Does it meet the packaging needs? Does it meet the medical situation needs that are here? That might not be self-evident here or here when people are ultimately thinking about a product that's going to end up here. Between WHOPQ and the NRAs, there is the collaborative procedure that um, Milan is going to be talking to you about, which is an effort for the regional authorities here or the national authorities to rely back on the work done by pre-qualification if it's the case of a product that came from an NRA and the inspection report is here and the assessment report is here. These will rely more on this and will make a decision based on that reliance within a certain period of time that Milan will talk about. There is also the possibility of joint reviews being done when the product is here. And one of the things that Milan is also going to be talking to you about now, because it's been a problem in the past, is that ones that were done here, when they came here, as we just mentioned, WHO doesn't have the inspection report. WHO doesn't have the assessment report to share with this one. It's back here. And so now WHO, and you'll hear the example today, is a situation where WHO brokered getting the reports from here to here so that it could go through 
this same kind of an expedited um, process. There is also now, at least in a theoretical sense, people talking about products that are not in scope for prequalification. And you have to remember that when you think about the WHO essential medicines list, only about 10 to 15 percent of those products are even eligible to go through PQ. PQ is from uh, malaria, for TB, for HIV, um, human reproductive products, and a couple of others. But those are the products that can go this route. But obviously there are many other products that are high priority products from a public health perspective that also could benefit if they had been originally um, authorized here. And WHO is willing to use its good offices when there is a, a, a high public health need to try to help that particular arm of it to go at the same time. Next, please. And just to give you, and I'm sure Milan can give you um, more updated, but this is just to kind of whet your appetite that this is not just a pilot that one or two things have happened, but in reality here, this is something now that involves 27 countries that have signed up to be a part of it. 43 medicines have gone through it that have represent over 106 individual registrations where medicines get registered in a series of countries at the same time, and the median time it has taken for this to occur is 74 days. So when you think of that spread and when you think of the time at the NRA, I think we believe at the foundation this is one of the premier procedures that is available to help kind of shrink that down to something more reasonable. And with that, Hopefully, I've whetted your appetite and at least kind of put it into a context. I'm going to turn it over to um, Milan Schmidt now, who is going to really give you the details and the history of this. Please, Milan.